I think we can all agree that as terrible as it is to lose people in accidents and freak occurrences, there is still some closure there knowing that there's nothing that could have been done to prevent their loss. And I think we can also all agree that the losses that are by far the most frustrating are the ones that are caused by someone else's negligence. I have to warn you, these will be some of the most frustrating stories you've ever heard. And although the descriptions of the events in this video are fleeting and non-descriptive, they are still highly disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. In early June of 2011, workers arrived at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Pool north of Boston and found that the pool was in pretty rough shape after having been closed for the season. The bottom was covered in leaves and sludge and garbage and the water was a murky greenish brown color. To make matters worse, there was no functioning vacuum on site to clean the bottom of the pool of all of the debris. But rather than delay the opening of the pool to clean it or wait until they could get a vacuum to remove all the debris, they went ahead and started going through the normal opening process. First, they added an additional 240,000 gallons of water to dilute the sludge. The hope was that this would dilute it enough that the pool's filters would then take care of the rest. Unsurprisingly, this failed and so workers were ordered not to add the chemicals to the pool, which was the last step to making the water clean enough to be safe to swim. But then for reasons that are unclear, just a few days before the normal scheduled opening, those chemicals were added anyway. Then, just like it had the years before, it opened on the 25th of June with the water still incredibly cloudy. It was apparently so bad that the visibility was limited to just a few feet, despite the fact that state regulations required that lifeguards sink a puck into the water all the way to the bottom of the deepest part of the pool and still see it. This wasn't done either, and so people flocked to the pool on the Saturday that it opened in the late June heat. The following day on Sunday, June 26th, a woman from the area named Mary and some of her neighbors and her neighbor's kids all decided to go to the pool to swim. In their group, there were four kids and several adults, and they all spent time by the poolside talking and swimming and taking turns playing with the kids in the water. At one point, Mary was playing with the nine-year-old son of one of the neighbors, and the two of them walked over to a big slide at the deepest section of the pool. The boy climbed up the ladder first, with Mary right behind him, and then she gave him a push, and he flew down the slide and into the water. He popped up out of the water and was laughing, and then Mary slid down and did the same. But when she did, she gained a little bit more momentum, and so as she came off the slide, she sort of grazed the boy as she hit the water. She surfaced right away and began to apologize, but before she could get the words out, she slipped back under the water's surface. The boy then tried to grab a hold of her to keep her afloat, but she was too far for him to reach. She then surfaced one more time, waving her arms wildly, but right away slipped back under the water and then to the bottom of the 12-foot depth. In a panic, the boy swam to the ladder at the side of the pool, got out, and went right to the nearest lifeguard. He told her what happened, but she replied back that she was on break. So the boy then went to tell a second lifeguard, who then told him that they'd do a pool check in a few minutes. Tragically, even if they had done a pool check, which they didn't, it was already too late for Mary. Obviously, this was an incredibly difficult situation for a nine-year-old to fully grasp. So after telling the lifeguards, he went back over to his family and started playing again, not really sure what to do. Then, since the group had sort of split up and were talking with different people, no one noticed that Mary was gone. Everyone just assumed that she had said goodbye to one person or another and didn't get the chance to come around to them. And because the water in the pool was so cloudy, no one knew that she was still down at the bottom. Eventually, it came time for the pool to close, so everyone left for the day. The gates were closed and Mary remained. The following day, so now on Monday, the pool opened once again and operated as normal. People swam, kids played, and the water remained cloudy. Mary's boyfriend tried to contact her, but after his calls went unanswered, he thought that she just wanted to be alone. The way the dynamic of the relationship was, this wasn't anything too out of the ordinary. And although Mary had five kids of her own, none of them lived with her at the time, so no one reported her missing. Eventually, it came time to close the pool again, and despite state regulations requiring bottom checks to be done on a daily basis, none were ever performed. So the following day on Tuesday, the pool opened once again. Kids played, people swam, and obviously, some of them were probably only feet from Mary at the bottom. Once again, the entire day went by and then the pool closed again in the evening. On that second night, a group of kids jumped the fence after hours to do some late night swimming and noticed something floating in the water. They walked over to check it out and realized that it was the body of a woman. Since it had been in the water for over two days, the normal decomposition process started taking place and caused it to float to the surface. Very quickly, the police were called and an investigation was launched. 
In the end, it was found that in addition to missing a ton of normal safety procedures, the pool's permit hadn't even been renewed that year. This led to a temporary shutdown of a total of 24 pools in the area and a complete demolition of the Veterans Memorial Pool. A new one was constructed in its place that is only 5 feet deep. On August 15, 1936, Riley and Minnie Drain said goodbye to their daughters Dorothy and Barbara and then headed off to work for the day. When they returned home, they walked in and right away knew something was wrong. While they were gone that day, an intruder had broken into their home and attacked both of their daughters. They ran to the room to find that tragically, Dorothy had been assaulted and had already died due to blunt force injuries. Barbara would survive, but her injuries were severe as it was later determined that a hatchet had been used in the attack. Due to the brutal nature of the crime, this obviously scared residents of their hometown of Pueblo, Colorado. Not only was it a horrific scene, but the culprit was still on the loose and apparently two other women had been attacked on the same day, leading the residents to believe that the attacks were connected and more could occur at any moment. This put pressure on the police in the town itself and the surrounding areas to arrest and interrogate anyone who might be involved. A little over a week later, on the 26th of August, a man named Henry Arity was arrested for vagrancy or homelessness after he was found wandering the rail yards of Cheyenne, Wyoming. Despite it being hundreds of miles south of Pueblo, the sheriff who made the arrest was aware of the crime that had occurred just a few weeks earlier and that the search was still ongoing. So during Henry's arrest, the sheriff went through his normal questioning and then started to ask about where he'd come from. And as it turned out, Henry had just taken a train in from Colorado. Upon finding this out, the sheriff started to press a little harder on the questioning, and as he became more suspicious, he began to ask very directly if Henry was involved. To his surprise, Henry fully confessed to the attack. With a full confession, Henry was taken and placed in a jail cell, while the sheriff then contacted the Pueblo police station to let them know he had found the culprit. But then when he spoke to the Pueblo police chief, he learned that another man had already been arrested in connection with the attack named Frank Aguilar. This man was a laborer from across the border and he'd worked with the Drain family in the weeks prior to the attack before being fired. Then, in addition to him knowing the family, an axe head was found at his home that matched the injuries found on the girls. But despite finding all of this out, the sheriff insisted that Henry was connected because he claimed that he was with a man named Frank at the crime scene. This was unfortunately either an outright lie or Henry was coerced into making this confession. Henry Arity was born in 1915 in Pueblo, Colorado to parents that had recently immigrated to the US from Syria. His parents were also first cousins and it's been suggested that this close blood relationship is what caused Henry and his siblings to be born with intellectual disabilities. Henry, for example, wasn't able to speak until the age of five years old and then after he did learn to speak, his parents enrolled him in a school but he was kicked out by the end of the year. The principal then told his parents that he was completely unable to learn anything and that he'd be best off somewhere else. His parents kept him home for the next few years before he was eventually enrolled in a state home for the mentally disabled at around the age of 10. Unfortunately, he lived there on and off for the next decade, but the conditions at the home weren't great either. Henry was mistreated by the other students and frequently got into physical altercations. So eventually when he was old enough, he left the school, hopped on a rail car, and ended up in Wyoming shortly before being arrested. Following his arrest and false confession, Henry was taken back to Pueblo to be charged and put in jail. Unfortunately, despite a number of other inconsistencies, the charges remained and Henry was eventually brought to stand trial. From the start of the trial, Henry's lawyer tried to plead for Henry to be declared insane in hopes of keeping him from receiving the death penalty. Incredibly, after several examinations, Henry was simultaneously declared sane but severely mentally disabled. It was determined that his IQ was just 46, which put him at roughly equivalent to a 6-year-old mentally. Even more, it was noted that he was completely incapable of distinguishing between right and wrong which means that he was incapable of performing any action with criminal intent. So even in the case that he had been involved, the charges should not have been as severe as they would for a normal person. During the trial as well, it was discovered that there was no physical evidence connecting Henry to the crime. On top of that, the other prime suspect, Frank Aguilar, also testified that he'd never seen Henry in his life. Then in addition to that, the surviving sister Barbara testified that Henry had not been present during the attack. But despite all of this, Henry was convicted of first-degree murder primarily on the basis of his false confession to the sheriff. This is a conviction that at the time carried the penalty of death. Following this sentencing, the Colorado Attorney General got involved in Henry's defense and tried desperately to get the conviction overturned. Unfortunately, all he was ever able to do was delay the punishment. Henry would go on to have his sentence delayed nine times before it could be delayed no longer. While held in prison awaiting punishment, Henry was coined the happiest person on death row by the prison warden. Apparently, he could often be seen in a cell playing with a toy train given to him by the warden, 
and the reason he was so happy was that he didn't understand why he was there or what was waiting for him. During his final weeks, he was treated well by both the guards and inmates, but eventually, that fateful day finally came. Henry was asked what he'd like for his last meal, and despite not realizing why he was being asked, he asked for ice cream. During the meal, the warden asked about the upcoming process, and clearly, Henry had no understanding of what was waiting for him. Upon being told it was time to go, Henry even asked to have the ice cream refrigerated so that he could finish it later when he came back. The prison warden could be seen crying in the viewing room, pleading with the Colorado governor to prevent it from happening, but ultimately, Henry passed away on January 6, 1939, at the age of 23. Obviously, today, we know that people with mental disabilities are much more susceptible to coercion and false confession. In 2011, Henry Arity was given a full and unconditional pardon. By all accounts, 16-year-old Kyle was a happy and well-adjusted teenager with a bright future when he woke up in the morning of Tuesday, April 10, 2018. After driving to the prestigious Seven Hills School in Cincinnati, Ohio, where he was a sophomore, Kyle spent the day attending class and thinking about his tennis game scheduled for that afternoon. At the end of the day, the bell rang and Kyle made his way back to the parking lot to get all of the stuff from his car, which was a Honda Odyssey. It wasn't what most teenagers would call a dream car, but it was safe and reliable, and with three rows of seats, it was definitely practical. It also had an open area in the back and a rear bench seat that could be folded up, flipped over, and stowed flush in a recessed compartment in the floor if you need more space. Because this rear seat needs to be folded and tilted down before being stowed away, it's not bolted to the floor like other seats in the minivan. It has two hinged areas, one where the backrest connects to the seat and another where it connects to the floor. That day, the backrest had already been folded down or Kyle may have lowered it when he went to the minivan. Either way, he was facing the back of the vehicle, so looking in the trunk when he knelt down on the flattened seat and reached for his tennis equipment on the floor. It's something that Kyle had probably done dozens of times before, but in this instance, his weight and the angle of his body caused the seat to roll backward just like it would have been if he was attempting to lower it into the compartment in the floor. This unexpected movement forced Kyle's head down toward the floor and pinned his torso between the seat and the minivan's rear door with his legs over his head. After the initial shock of being pinned in the trunk, Kyle struggled desperately to try to free himself, but the angle of how he was stuck meant that it was his own weight plus the weight of the seat itself that was pinning him in place. On top of that, because he was stuck with his arms at an awkward angle, he couldn't get any leverage to flip the seat back up. So after struggling for a bit, Kyle realized that he was really stuck in this position and he would need someone else to come help him. But to make things worse, with his arms pinned underneath him and with the seat blocking him from being able to reach his pants, he couldn't reach his cell phone that were in his pants pocket above his head. He'd also closed the van door before going into the trunk, so if he tried to yell for help, it was unlikely that anyone would hear him. But worst of all, soon he started to realize that with the full weight of the seat pinning his chest against the door, he was having a harder and harder time breathing. Between the seat and the weight of his legs, his chest was being crushed with each breath. Thankfully, soon enough, Kyle realized that he could still make a call from 911 using voice activation. And as soon as he realized he could do this, he made the call to 911. When the first call was picked up by a 911 operator at 3.14 p.m., Kyle was frantic and yelling and banging for help. And over the course of the call, Kyle managed to tell the operator that he was trapped in his van and that he was in desperate need of help. Now bear in mind that he was yelling from below the seat and the phone was in his pants pocket. But either way, by the desperation in his voice, it had to have been clear that something was seriously wrong. Kyle also managed to communicate the exact parking lot that he was stuck in, which was the Seven Hills parking lot, and the final thing that he managed to get out before the call was disconnected was that he thought that he was going to die soon. The call then disconnected three minutes from the time it was picked up at 3.17pm. The operator tried to call back but only got Kyle's voicemail, and then following the call, the operator incorrectly labeled the priority of the call, making it seem less serious than it actually was. So it was assigned a code 2, which means urgent. But for any situation where someone's life is in danger, like how Kyle described the situation and that the operator heard, it should have been given a code 3 indicating an emergency. The operator also made a note that Kyle might have been stuck in the parking lot across the street despite having the exact address of where Kyle was stuck. In any case, police were dispatched to the scene and arrived at the parking lot at 3.26pm, so just 9 minutes later. They then proceeded to drive through the parking lot looking for any signs of someone stuck, but at no point did they get out of their car. They searched the south side of the parking lot before leaving the lot entirely and heading across the street to check some of the other parking lots. And of course, Kyle's van was parked in the north side of the parking lot, which they never searched. During this time, they called his phone, but it went straight to voicemail. Eight minutes later, at 3.34pm, while police were still on the scene, Kyle managed to make a second 911 call. 
This call was taken by a different operator who answered by saying, Cincinnati 911, what's your emergency? The operator then asked if anyone was there and Kyle went on to say, I probably don't have much time left to tell my mom that I love her if I die. He then wanted to say, this is not a joke. This is not a joke. I'm trapped inside my gold Honda Odyssey van in the sophomore parking lot of Seven Hills. Send officers immediately. I'm almost gone. This was all recorded by the operator system. For some reason, the operator then hung up the phone call and called back only to get Kyle's voicemail. Incredibly, then after the phone call, the operator looked up the number and saw that a call had been made just 10 minutes earlier, but never went on to tell a supervisor or let police know about the second call. This was the last call made from Kyle's phone. Police officers left the scene just three minutes later at 3.37 p.m. That evening, after Kyle never returned home, his parents activated an app that they had to find his phone, which took them to the school parking lot. At just before 9 p.m., Kyle's dad found him trapped in the van. He quickly pulled Kyle out with the help of someone from the school and then tried to perform CPR, but it was already too late. Kyle's family eventually filed a wrongful death suit against the city for the role played by both the operators and the police officers. In 2021, a $6 million settlement was awarded to the family. Hello everyone, my name is Sean and welcome to Scary Interesting. Thank you all so much for watching and hopefully I will see you in the next one.